Godo Tutorials is not sponsored by or affiliated with the Godo Game Engine. Welcome to the 7 Rhetorics of Play episode. My name is Josie and I'll be your guide for this episode. I also have a website at godotutorials.com, so please feel free to check that out. In this episode I will be going over the following. The Ambiguity of Play and going over each of the seven rhetorics of play. The Ambiguity of Play is a book written by Brian Sutton Smith, who happens to be both a psychologist and a play theorist. The Ambiguity of Play simply discusses why people play games and explains that games have cultural importance to the people that play them. The seven rhetorics of play is basically seven reasons that Brian theorized are the main core reasons why people play games. Lastly, Brian mentions that playing games has roots in both culture and biology and that if you want to learn more about the biological reasons people play games, that it's best to look into why animals play games. The seven rhetorics is basically Brian's seven reasons on why people play games, and they are progress, fate, power, identity, imaginary, the self, and frivolity. Let's start with play as progress. Basically, the idea is that games serve as a function for the individual's cognitive development along with the development of the group culture. The idea is that as the play increases in complexity of player skill, so too does their own personal human growth. And this is even more so true with children. The reason being that children, at an early age, seek to learn and adapt to one day become adults. The core tenet of the play as progress is that games allow for personal growth, mainly through skills obtained to overcome a game challenge. Keep this in mind as it's a core foundational idea of level design and game progress. Next up is play as fate. Basically, the idea is that sometimes games appeal to us because it touches on something in humanity's past and is almost spiritual in nature. In modern times, play as fate could also be called a game of chance or gambling. Basically, the argument is that a game of chance touches on something mystical and more ancient. For example, gambling, which is a game of chance, which at its core is a game of fate, is basically a game where the results are left up to the gods of the universe. In a sense, by winning a game of fate, you are creating the illusion that you have mastery over life and more control over the universe than the gods themselves. Having more power than the gods is an addictive feeling to have, and it's why some people will go bankrupt for a chance at winning it. Eric Erickson also referred to this as the hallucination of ego mastery. Let's look at a quick example. In this example, let's talk about the $1 billion lottery game. The odds of winning the $1 billion lottery are 1 in 300 million. The odds of being struck by lightning is 1 in 500,000. Winning the $1 billion lottery game is equivalent to being struck by lightning 600 times. Players of the $1 billion lottery game have a better chance at getting struck by lightning twice than winning that game. Yet, despite that, People get together for the purpose of pooling their savings, and in some very sad situations, sell their houses, then they buy all the tickets they can, and they break into tears when they lose. The reason for doing such drastic things for the sake of winning the $1 billion lottery is for the purpose of beating fate, beating the gods for not being born rich, to take fate into their own hands. In a sense, to beat fate, you must have a strong internal will to go all out because fate itself is the most powerful form in the universe. Gambling, for reasons I don't want to mention, it saddens me because it tackles humans on many psychological layers. The play for fate is just one layer. Next is the play is power. Some people play games only for the sake of contest and status. Play for power can be separated into two categories, physical skill and intellectual strategy. Playing for power allows people to release pent up energy and stress that they have internalized. It allows people to play for glory and honor, for both themselves and the groups they belong to. It allows people to showcase their skills and status among other members playing the game. Playing for power is common in competitions, and since all members of the game are there voluntarily, all members tend to have a feeling of unity in community rather than the feelings of division. Next is that people play games simply for identity purposes. Playing games gives people the ability to express themselves and allow for people to bond. Unlike play for power where people are showcasing skill, Play for identity simply has the purpose of building communities and forming relationships with others. Think of games such as World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy XIV. Next on the list is play as imaginary. In this case, there are people who play games for the sake of transforming into something else. Many children play the game of house, where they get to transform into adults. They transform into adults despite having the maturity of children. The idea of play as imaginary is that games can combine elements of creativity and flexibility to create the world through the eyes of a child. In this case, a world full of imagination. Most games are played outside the bounds of reality, yet for only a moment we allow ourselves to be engrossed in it. For a moment we allow the child inside of us to come out and play. The next on the list is play as self. The idea is that games can sometimes have roots that form around the psychology of the individual playing the game. 
Sometimes games just fulfill the desire of an individual. The desires fulfilled can include wish fulfillment, tension release, mastery of skill, repetition compulsion, escapism, ego boosting. The desire being satisfied is dependent on the individual, and no two individuals are the same in terms of their psychology. In a sense, people play games to satisfy a personal desire that is unique to them, and them alone. Last and not least is play as frivolity. In layman's term, games are fun. Humans are serious animals and playing games allow us to enter a carefree and fun state of mind, which is the opposite of the serious state of mind that we live inside of most of our waking lives. It's hard work being human, going to school, working a job, raising children, and the list can go on and on. Basically, we live by making thoughtful and careful decisions because life has consequences to our actions, and especially to our mistakes. Games are lighthearted and very silly. They allow us to turn off the seriousness of the world and just for a moment enter a carefree state of mind. In a sense, it could be considered a form of escapism, an escape from the seriousness of the world and to enter a world of fun. The real question to ask is, what is fun? This leads us to our homework for this episode. Pick a game that satisfies a single rhetoric in the seven rhetorics of play. You should have seven unique games, so that means no sequels or prequels. The games do not have to only be video games, they can be any type of game. Well, that's all I have for you in this episode. Thank you for subscribing and liking this episode. Thank you so much for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Have an amazing day.